morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Open Data Saves Lives. Um, if you've not joined us before, we'll spend the first two or three minutes letting people connect to audio and get um, set up. And um, people to be fashionably late to a um, Zoom call. You can tell the ODI Leads team with their t shirts, badges, and backgrounds. If you would like an open data sexualized batch, um, if you send a self-addressed envelope for the older people in the, uh, uh, on the call, um, or send us an email, uh, we'll try and uh, organize you to, uh, to have an uh, open data sexualized badge large enough so you can see it on the a video screen. Which is the, these are the largest badges um, available to man. Um, just, just for future reference, if they can be non-reflective next time as well, Paul, because you're getting quite a lot of... Uh, oh, mate. <laughs> Sorry. I think it's the way I've, I've sat, I've sat, there we go. There we go, that's better. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> I like making Paul move around, it's great fun. I think that's so good, yeah. Too much light at ODI leads, uh, which is good. So people are still joining, uh, which is great. And we'll keep filling. So, um, welcome to the, um, I guess, the summer recess of uh, Open Data Saves Lives. We started in March, uh, running it every week uh, with people responding to the, um, uh, the COVID crisis and the pandemic. Um, it came out of our work in 2019 and was very applicable to um, what we've all been going through. Uh, uh, this year. If you have seen the Open Data Sales Lives webpage, I will um, get to just share my screen. People can see that, yeah. This is uh, Open Data Sales Lives webpage. All of the um, outputs are here, all of the videos, all of the sessions, all of the assets and resources. Um, and this is our um, approach to uh, trying to put assets and resources in a way that's easily findable on the web to support all of our response to, uh, to COVID and other aspects of um, data infrastructure to respond to uh, health and social care in the UK. And it's also supposed to be a little bit of fun as well. And so we're running sessions um, uh, live, trying to be 45 minutes long, they're easily digestible, and we've got interesting speakers each week to, to join in uh, with us. We're gonna do two in August, uh, one today, hopefully, uh, and we've got three uh, really fantastic speakers, which you can the next session agenda here. People are still joining us. Dun, dun, dun. Come on, internet. Uh, my name is Paul Connell. At early, you can see Patrick Lake and Giles Dring, all with our fully badged up uh, work. We've got Hannah Thompson, who's going to talk about building an open and collaborative COVID patient genomic buyback. Sounds smack on the money for what we uh, what we do. Graham, friend of ODI Leads, talking about linking data opportunities to uh, what's happening in COVID and protecting vulnerable people. Um, and Jared um, Keller, who I don't think has joined us yet, um, hopefully be here, but they did a piece of work around data stewardship. Oh, hi, Joe, Jared, how are you hi. doing? Uh, working with the Health Foundation, um, and the Health Foundation had, had joined as partners at the start of this because they've written some really great work around how you, um, not only, I think, stewarding data, but convene and steward a network to make an impact with um, data and open innovation, um, which I guess is what we're doing here. So how do you create the uh, energy? How do you create the community? How do you create the, um, the ways that we can all work together as humans, um, not just machines in what we do? So uh, have a look at the webpage uh, whilst you are listening to the talks, see what we've got going on. Um, and also um, um, 
have a look at, have a think about how you want to join in because um, since our last Open Data Saves Life session, um, we are very happy to have uh, won a small amount of funding working with ODIHQ about how we can turn what the Health Foundation talks about, about um, a, a successful ecosystem around data and health into something that's sustainable. Um, so that's how do we create a new institution that is open, shared, low cost, but massively impactful um, into something that can, that can work. So ourselves, Health Foundation, Beautiful Info, ODIHQ are all working on that alongside uh, working on Open Data Saves Lives. We've got two sessions in uh, August. We're then got, um, we're going to run um, from September um, sessions every two weeks. And we've got some great speakers um, who are going to talk to us. So Anna Powell Smith, who I don't think uh, some of you might have heard, uh, Dark Greener on Twitter. Have a look at that. Um, she's um, set up a new um, uh, institute, Institute for Public Data, which is going to talk about filling the gaps in public data for the UK. Um, uh, funded by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, which is which is amazing. So she's going to, I'm, I'm guessing at the moment, so she's going to come and talk to us. Um, we've also got uh, Tom Reardon, who you probably know, he's going to come and talk to us um, in September as well about the track and trace system and what it means for a, a local authority. So that should be fascinating. Uh, we've had a, uh, a number of good conversations with him over the last couple of months about how we can help and giving him some hints and tips uh, for that. So that's going to be really good. Uh, we've got uh, Trafford Data Lab lined up, who you might have seen some of their um, really good uh, dashboards that they built for local authorities about understanding what's going on. Um, so there's a whole bunch of people who are lined up to, to join in with Open Data Lives over the next few months. And then if you want to join us in this discussion about how we build a new institution, uh, with my son Mark Fars here from Beautiful Info um, and down there, if you want to talk to us, the Health Foundation, ODIHQ, beautiful info about how this thing can uh, grow and develop, uh, please reach out. Uh, we've had a couple of um, really positive uh, conversations with lots of people over the last uh, couple of months, so uh, please do join in. Okay, so uh, before we start, if there's any questions, just put them in the chat. Uh, someone's already said uh, hello, which is great. And um, I am going to pass over to Hannah uh, Thompson, who's going to tell us all about uh, Biobank. All right, thanks, Paul. So I'm Hannah, Business Development Executive at Sano Genetics. So thanks very much for having me. I'm excited to share what we're up to with our COVID work. So um, Sano is sort of traditionally a matchmaking service for clinical trials and research studies and we specialize in finding patient cohorts with specific genetic variants and we thought that might be useful for the covid era so we recently won an innovate you grant uk grant to build a patient-centric genomic biobank of those suffering from covid related illness and we're going to use this opportunity to help accelerate research into something that's being called long COVID. So at the moment, there are basically a quite a heavy research focus on the acute phase of COVID. So that's when you're sort of in hospital, you've got the, the virus, and you've got severe illness related to that. And people are trying to figure out why some people are more likely to get that. And then also obviously treatment and recovery methods to help those patients. But you might have noticed in the news that there's lots of patients with symptoms and illness for like hundreds of days afterwards. Um, and basically that's not been a bit of focus of the scientific research so far. So we're trying to build um, a biobank that will help to capture that patient generated data of those people who are suffering different types of illness over that time period and we're going to match that with genotyping data and that's really exciting so we're sort of developing our research questions as we go and as we speak to collaborators but essentially we want to understand which population should be shielding from, from coronavirus exposure and to sort of let that population know exactly why they might be more at risk in a nice open friendly way um, so we've got some money from Innovate UK as I mentioned for that 
and our initial plans are to do 1,000 patients and we obviously would love to do much more. So we hope to partner with sequencing companies, researchers, biotech and pharma to make this much bigger. And that's something I've been doing over the last four weeks as I've started working on this project. And it's really exciting. I've got some really lovely people in the pipeline to work with. And just wanted to show you a little bit more about our platform. So it's a really user friendly way for patients to engage with scientific research. They, patients and participants can actually decide exactly what data to share and what studies to join, um, which is really nice. And we have fully customizable surveys, which allow us to easily collect longitudinal data. So if you're one of our collaborators and you suddenly think of another question to ask this patient population, we can do that easily because they're already engaged with the research and they're here on our platform ready to answer those next questions, which is really cool. And the cool thing about what we've already done and what we've proven over the past three years we've been operating is um, that we have home testing logistics all set up. So when we want to genotype certain patients, we just send them a saliva kit and then send it off to our sequencing partners and that's all done and dusted. But I guess the most exciting thing about Sana's platform is it really works within our company values, which are to build and maintain trust with those that we work with. So we share regular updates with the patients and participants that we have. We know that it's frustrating for some to work with researchers and just not send them samples and then not hear anything at all about what happened with their sample or their research. So that's really one of our key things that we're liking and our patients are really liking as well. So that's a sort of whistle stop tour of what we're up to. It's very early days, but if you want to get involved, you can definitely email me at hannah at sanogenetics.com. Or if you've experienced long COVID or you just wanna participate in the collaboration or sign up to our newsletter to hear what we're up to, you can go to the website, sanogenetics.com forward slash land forward slash COVID-19 and you can sign up there and we're really open to any feedback or any ideas um, it'd be great to hear if you'd like to get involved as well and that was my whistle stop tour for today but lovely to chat with you all if you want to ask me anything in the chat then please do fantastic um so i have got a question which i'll just put in the chat and then there's, a, there's another um question about uh, making the research open. So there's um, uh, one of the um, principles of, uh, that we've identified through Open Data Saves Lives is allowing patients to, sh to sh you know, hashtag share my data. So mm -hmm. um, are you looking at how your cohorts can share stories and feedback to each other? So if you like, like a support group, is that something you've thought about? Yes, we love the idea of building a community. We've actually just hired our full-time community manager and um, so we do at the minute have blogs podcasts from people who participate in our research and have the specific conditions that we're interested in researching but i think yeah there's much more work to do to make it really community and be able to share directly with each other um, but that's something we're working on we're a team of 15 so we're growing and we're hoping to do that yeah in the future um, and then obviously um, sharing how you do that and the permissioning and the, I guess people you know, um, would be, would be great if you could share some of that openly with us and then we could share that with others so that, that we don't continuously reinvent the wheel around IG and ethics that we, we get it fixed once or twice and then people share and build on top of it. Mm. Yeah. Well, at the minute how it works with our platform is you can sign up as a participant and then you'll be given the details of the studies so the researchers that we are working with and you're able to sort of toggle on and off on your on our platform on your profile where you'd like your data to go um so that's how we work it at the minute we are open to happy to share more with you Fantastic. guys and we've all, yeah, yeah. Figure out so, yeah i've got a person i think my, i think my mum's got long covid and Paul mm. Clark from BI, it looks like his partner's got it as well. So there's a, it's, it's, not, it's very common. Mm, um, exactly. So uh, before we move, just uh, if people could put their questions in the chat, that would be great. The last one is, um, will you be, I guess, the, 
consenting and making the research open and how does that um, how does that work in the um, uh, as you develop uh, your work about how you're going to share this and how open it's going to be and licensing and all those great things mm. to do. yeah so we're part of the covid host genetics initiative which is a sort of large consortium of people sharing data um, so we hope to be able to share the data with those researchers who are interested um, but obviously that will be consented via the patients as well and as we go forward we sort of look at each partnership individually and understand like you say if we're able to build a genomic biomarker or something that can help predict how patients might might um, go on to suffer illness then yeah it's something we need to think about it's not um, in our our company isn't specifically looking to commercialize anything but we do want to work with people who will bring impact into this and if it is through commercialization of things like that then we just need to be open with our patients and our participants and see if they want to be involved in that kind of work but it's all open and happy to have a chat with everybody that has those kinds of ideas really fantastic well uh, so we got a request um uh, so patrick and amy will be in touch afterwards about putting a um a link to all your work on our open data awesome. science page thank you and then contact you know and hopefully that'll be searchable for through us and through you as well and then yeah. Um, maybe we could get um, some of your team involved, uh, linked in with the Open Data Saves Lives work so that they can uh, dip in and dip out of our work and, and share and learn in what we're doing. So thanks very much for, for joining us and, and welcome to the, um, welcome to the, the Open Data Saves Lives um, fellow travellers. Thanks. It's been nice. Looking forward Great to stuff. catch up with everybody. Yes. So, uh, so there'll be some... Um, stuff in the chat if you want to put your email in the chat as well people can uh, follow up with you so next up is graham hyde um, and you have some things to say i guess so over to you graham hopefully um yeah. let me see if i can share my screen do, 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 do this well just before we go on uh peter you had your hand up did you want to make a point there Peter Wells. Okay, Karen. <laughs> okay, go, 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 Graham. Peter, yeah. Over to you, Graham. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, can people see a slide that says COVID 19 shielding and linking? Excellent. Yes. Okay. Yes, Fab. So uh, this will be a whistle stop tour of some fun stuff that I've been doing in Leeds. So my name's Graham Hyde. I'm very lucky to have a role where it's jointly between Leeds City Council and NHS Leeds CCG. Um, and basically, I am supporting the business intelligence data part of developing what's called local care partnerships in Leeds, which you might not have heard of, and I'm not going to go into them right now, um, but they are building on primary care networks that are a, a new thing in health um, across the across England. So I'm, I'm not going into that, but I was almost in the wrong place at the wrong time um, when COVID uh, started and some data started uh, flying about from Ministry of um, Housing, uh, whatever they are, MHCLG. Exactly. So there was this pa shielded patient list that uh, that was starting to flow to local authorities. Open data lines, but yes, if it's quick. Um, and in Leeds, there right at the start of COVID nineteen, um, there was some work that was done centrally, I think by NHS Digital, and they identified about 18,000 people that needed to be, uh, to, to needed a letter to say that they needed to shield. Um, about a month later, that list increased massively to about 45,000 people in Leeds who were identified that needed to shield. Um, and that was done from a variety of sources. I won't go into that either. But there were terms like clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, and that's a bit of a definition there of how they were um, found. So again, I'm not going into that. Um, but there are a load of people in Leeds that we needed to 
kind of virtually hug, if you like, and offer them support um, for various um, reasons. So one of the things in a meeting that I was in suddenly dawned on me, we've got all these people, how can we be assured that each of those 45,000 people that has been identified is receiving the support that they deserve or they need during this COVID-19 crisis? How can we how can we as a city assure ourselves that we're doing the best that we possibly can for all of those people? And essentially that no one is falling between the cracks. Um, we, we certainly don't, we certainly want to offer a, um, a service to, to everybody where, wherever they live. So in that shielded patient list, um, we were getting the NHS number, so possibly job done. So that NHS number was was good. It was uh, the data was was pretty well. It was was accurate. Um, so that actually meant that we could then link that patient list to other health data sets, such as which GP practice they were were registered at. Um, and various demographics data from primary care that is captured in Leeds. Um, so we were able to link um, to ethnicity, which is a pretty hot topic around COVID, and also how these people preferred to be communicated to. Um, so that possibly was job done. Um, and then as ever, somebody wanted a dashboard and I sort of pushed back on it, but actually, we've been doing a dashboard it's now stopped thankfully um but it was just a position of where we were in terms of the total number of people who were were being asked to shield broken down by um various kind of age bands and actually there was another job to do um so if you had received a letter saying you should be shielding there were, on that letter there was also an option to proactively register yourself on a telephone line or on a website to say yes i can confirm that i've received a letter and actually i could do with a bit of extra support so we were kind of monitoring monitoring performance which is a bad thing in this in this sort of scenario but the people wanted it um, so kind of by slicing and dicing the data we could then just do a rough percentage of those people who had put their hand up and proactively registered that they needed some support against the total number of people in those age bands or whatever category um, who had been asked to shield so we've done some um, slicing and dicing of ages ethnicity as i say is very very hot topic um and really it just hopefully promotes the question is this the best that is this the best that we can do for these people is there any anything else that we need to do for these people so there's other stuff that i thought that we could also link to as well and really try to understand if these people were already in touch with other statutory services across the city so data sets held by the local authority so Leeds city council does not always contain the nhs number so that was a bit of a bit of a stopper um because linking some of you might have linked on addresses and postcodes and to be fair that's an absolute nightmare um housing data doesn't contain um nhs numbers so we don't know if somebody is a council tenant or if they live in sheltered accommodation um council tax information doesn't have um an nhs number so we couldn't find out whether or not a person living at a particular property ha lived alone for example as a proxy for living alone was the single person discount on council tax adult social care at least city council does hold the nhs number so that was a that was a bonus and being a geographer um i don't mind admitting that where stuff happens is important i think so um some bloke called hancock um has many failings um but he has seemed to have nailed this definition so there is a thing that we could use to link data sets and that is called the unique property reference number and matt hancock says that and on this particular thing i agree with him i don't agree with him on a lot of things um and the uprn and also the usrn which is a street reference number 
and those associated X and Y coordinates are now becoming more open um, uh, just recently. So that's all good and positive. So just as a slight geeky example, um, if we were to match stuff based on addresses and postcodes, we know the X and Y coordinates of a postcode, but it's a centroid of a postcode. As we all know, a postcode is about 13 to 15 addresses. But actually, if we're using a UPRN X and Y coordinate, that is the X and Y coordinate of every single property. So we're getting, we're getting much better accuracy. So I think um, where you live has a direct impact on your health and well-being and your health inequalities. As I said, postcodes sometimes have spaces, don't have spaces, have zeros, have O's. Matching addresses um, is, a, is, a, is a nightmare. Um, the UPRN is a really simple 12-digit number. It never changes, so it's far easier to link across data sets. Um, and there's also published, again, published open data linking UPRNs to higher levels of geography from the ONS. So pretty key early doors um, with this shielding stuff. Um, I had a bit of an idea. So again, it's just we've got a list of 45,000 people. Can we kind of produce some more insight about those people. We can link because we know where those properties are with the UPRN. We know which lower level super output area they fall in. We know which LSOA is in what deprivation decile. So this is a, 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 a chart that shows those people who have been advised to shield in Leeds by IND decile. And I reckon we wouldn't have known that if we'd have linked, if we hadn't have linked those 45,000 records to uh, the UPRN and then the LSOA. And to me, that's pretty interesting that by far and away, the most people who've been advised to shield in Leeds are in IMD Decile 1, which is the most deprived areas. We might have had a bit of a hunch about that, but we've got some data to, to back that up. And we can then um, basically flex our um, offer and our support and and uh, focus I suppose to those people health inequalities is is real kind of um, buzzwords at the moment for all the right reasons um, in Leeds and across across England we've got things called primary care networks and this is a beautiful map um, of those primary care networks and again we're able to slice and dice and present that data um, of people who, who've been advised to shield because we know where they are and also back to our local care partnerships we're able to do that. In Leeds, um, some of you may know who live in Leeds, the, the, the city has come together to provide um, 33 ward-based hubs for the distribution of help and support. So again, we know the numbers of people who are being advised to shield by ward, which potentially is predicting the demand on those um, 33 ward based hubs for all sorts of things, food distribution and, 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 and other stuff. Um, we're also able to identify um, 0 to 18 year olds and again slice that data into the school clusters. Something else that we've got in Leeds which is pretty um, I reckon unique. So Leeds City Council commissions a number of um, membership organisations called Neighbourhood Networks to support its older population. And Neighbourhood Networks have a defined patch, if you like. So again, they have some element of geography. Um, so these organisations were able to anonymously share their member database addresses into the city council. So we're not interested in the names and addresses, uh, the names and the dates of birth and all that sort of stuff about these these um, members. We're just interested in the address. We then attached a UPRN to the, all those addresses, and then we're able to link that information to say at that household somebody has received a letter to say that they have been uh, asked to shield and somebody at that household has also said we need some support with um, uh, carrying food across the threshold for example. So again providing support and extra insight into our neighbourhood networks, we know who their members are, we know where they live, we can link other stuff to them. Um, so 
just as a before anyone asks it's absolutely not appropriate for a volunteer so these are volunteer organizations it's not appropriate for a volunteer to contact someone directly to inform them that they're on a list for uh, shielding for medical reasons that was handled by the gps this is really about support um kind of food and uh, social vulnerability support a nice byproduct of this work is that we've been able to provide um, a bit of an address cleansing service back to the neighbourhoods and also provide them with UPRNs for all of their addresses, which some of them have said they will update their databases with. So any future data sharing then becomes a lot easier. We're also able to identify those properties within the catchment areas of neighbourhood networks um, but not necessarily registered with a neighbourhood network um, who also could kind of the, the other people that we don't necessarily know about we can then send them targeted letters um, targeted information about the support that is available in their area um, because we know where they live um, this UPRN linkage was also extended to an organization called Carers Leeds. So in Leeds, if you are a, a carer, you can register with this organization. It's not 100% coverage of carers, it's just the ones that we know about. So again, a similar process, able to anonymous, anonymously match addresses with a UPRN and provide that information back to neighborhood networks and also um, other organizations to say somebody within this household, so again, not identifying people, but somebody within that household um, has been identified as a carer. So again, just providing more information back to people. Um, we've also then been able to, because we know um, which GP practice these people are registered at, we can then provide data back to the GP practices about the people um, at registered with their practice. And as I said, providing geographically tailored letters um, to the people on that list with local information based on where they live. So shielding has been paused as of the 1st of August, but there is still some support that is available. You know, they're, they're, they're not getting their deliveries of food parcels anymore, but there is support available. So just pointing people always in the right direction around local support um, based on where people live. So hopefully what I've demonstrated here is, is we're doing stuff with open data. LSOA boundaries are open, the UPRN is becoming more open and using certainly using geography as a geographer to drive decisions and drive support and also to further understand health inequalities and to try and narrow the, the gap in terms of health inequalities. So that's all I've got to say. Any questions? Thanks, Graham. Um, fantastic work. And again, I think we'd like to get that written up and get it on Open Data Lives because um, my, 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 one of my first questions is, is if, if Leeds didn't have you, would they have been able to do this? Uh, and um, your passion for geography and UPRNs and your, your, your ranting about it. I don't rant, Paul. Um, I don't know if I don't know if Leeds would. I, I only know about it because of my career path. I worked at Hambleton District Council for a while in an office with people um, doing street naming and numbering and the gazetteer. So, um, so that's kind of where the passion has come from. Um, so, yeah. I guess yeah, my, my point of view, my point is, is that can we help you um, share this openly and in, in, uh, so that others can join in? So, somebody in Bournemouth can take the old work and de deploy and use this. And I think that's the main thing for Open Data Lives because it's fantastic work. Um, and yes. how, and, and we sh we, we've we got to create the tool sets and we've got to create there and, it, and we've got to get over the not invented here approach, but also, yeah. um, you know, it's, 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 it's fantastic work um, and we need, to, we need to help that be as, as open as possible so it can be used. And the, the fact that you work across the council and the health um, organization I can't remember which part of the NHS yeah, you, you work in but um, yeah. uh, we need to make that as uh, as important as useful as possible and probably not shared via um, NHS futures but shared via the web so um, uh, absolutely and I, I think um, if we can so the so my life's work is to, is to get this UPRN as the the linking thing of addresses across all data sets 
And if you look at, um, there's a website, uh, GeoPlace, um, so they are custodians of this UPRN, and they've got, you know, they, their plan is to make it in the UPRN into health data sets. So, you know, this is this is where it needs to happen to enable it, it's so easy to link data on a 12 digit number that never changes it's 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 genius it. yeah great so uh, there's a couple of questions here around um uh well there's, there's is bame actually appropriate um uh, you know i don't know anyone who self-identifies as a bame person um so there's a bit of politics around that and, and but um Giles is thinking about a uh, demographic view of leads. We've got some stuff around that. Um, Mark's point around um, alternatives to, um, to BAME. I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, Claire saying, well done for using UPRNs. Um, uh, people without addresses. Okay. Um, and then Peter wants to, uh, he has put his hand up this time. So um, do you want to take them in a, in a round? So the BAME description, um, uh, UPRN, what happens next, and also people without an address, so travellers or um, vulnerable people in uh, who were housed in um, when it was uh, everybody in. Wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mark's point about the BAME thing, I, I'm not sure I have a view on that at the moment. There's been other folk that have picked up, certainly on Twitter, um, Mike Chitty, who is probably known to some folk in Leeds around you know stop labeling we're just labeling more people in a slightly different way they're just a person um, I don't have an opinion on that at the moment but I can see where people are going and what Mark says about uh, a Muslim living in a white dominated whatever you want to call it street is is different to a, a Muslim living in a Muslim dominated street absolutely I totally get that I don't know the solution to that um, people without addresses. So what we've found in Leeds is there is a GP practice um, uh, called York Street who specialise or, or, or they they look after homeless and vulnerable people and those people on the shielding list who are known with a GP record um, will be registered at the York Street GP practice as their home for for want of a better phrase um good question about the gypsies and travelers that's not come across my work in any of this so i suppose that's a bit of a failure um so i don't really know the answer to that um why do we persist with postcodes given the attributes of a uprn i suppose a postcode is more well a postcode is for delivering mail and it's relatively easy to remember and a 12 digit UPRN number is less easy to remember and is not um, I suppose doesn't have the press and the sexiness of a postcode um, sexy postcodes sexy you know. postcodes yeah if that's a thing um, yeah and I'll have a think about what Giles has said about demographic view of IMD populations for leads. Just just on that, Graham, I think Tom has actually probably done some work on that anyway, so I'll see if I can dig it out and link you to it. Okay. It, it was just basically, um, as I was looking at it, I was thinking, does that chart that shows a big spike of IMDs, it, uh, one, um, is that is that um, proportional to the overall layout of leads in terms of people that live within that demographic, or, or is there something else going on there? Uh, it'd be easy to read it either way, so it's just yeah. a, sort of a comment yeah. on that. Yeah. Fab. Okay, uh, Peter, you had a point you wanted to raise? Uh, yes, I'll be quick. The, I know there's other things to cover and you'd like to get finished. I really, I really like the work, Graham. I'm chatting to somebody else earlier on, uh, later on today, actually, about trying to make UPRNs more discoverable. That's a, a bit of a mission I'm on at the moment, as they can be hard to discover the, for people who can't afford the ordinance surveys prices. The just one thing on this particular use case is so I occasionally worry because I worry a lot about when we get down to individual individual data sets with individuals that we miss people. So we know there were people missing from the shielding list that NHS Digital created because there were gaps in the data and gaps in the processes. Uh, we know there's always going to be some people missing, 
and I'm wondering how in your in your work around this how you how you bring in that kind of either the feedback loop to add more people or messaging that says not everyone will be on this list therefore other routes to support what we need Okay, so from what I understand, um, the initial shielding list was created by um, an algorithm from NHS Digital, and then there's been a huge amount of work. So then, and then there, like a month later, there was a, another run of that data and loads more people were found. Certainly in Leeds, there's been uh, data submitted from Leeds teaching hospitals um, into that shielded list. There was a, some data quality issues with that I won't go into that um, but there's been a huge amount of work in GP practice so in, in primary care land of people checking records adding people to the shielding list removing people from the shielding list so a, you know a two-way process so I think in certainly in Leeds and I can't speak for any other local authority we've we've done as as much as we can I think there has been a concern that we have been adding flags into um, TPP and EMIS into primary care systems. How does that information get sucked out and fed into NHS Digital and the, the shielded patient list? We, we kind of can do everything that we can in Leeds, but it's that in the background national system. Some of us don't have as much confidence in that as we possibly should because we just don't think it works um yeah i'll say no more on that either <laughs> maybe we can pick it up on, an, on another session and i think uh alistair's obviously here from nhs digital and their open data team so there's um we have got a line in to that and i think that's one of the great benefits yeah. of open data saves lives is that we can have we can have that chat only open and you know um yeah. No, more than happy to feed it. So, um, amongst friends, yeah. Yeah, no, because I mean, um, it's interesting. So it's feeding in through GPEZ, it's the GP extraction service, I believe now. Um, I need to check that. Um, and also we've now published more open data on that. So if you go back to our own data hub, you can now sort of see some of that breakdown. And I think we've started flagging, or will be flagging where clinicians have added folks versus the algorithm. And you can see there's lots of interesting things going on there. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's evolving still. But yeah, there is more open data on that if people are interested. So if you go to our hub, um, you can see a bit more detail on that as of last Thursday. Great. Uh, I feel a um, uh, NHS digital open data um, full session. You know, what you've got, where it's coming, uh, what's in the pipeline. Um, We've got vaccinations coming up now. Um, so that's on next week. So uh, permission to contact people um, volunteering for trials so we can see which okay. Leeds is doing really well, by the way, in terms of people volunteering and being uh, altruistic. Um, so there's, yeah, some more stuff coming, but happy to have a chat about that. But yeah. Fab. Fab stuff. So um, that was really great, Graham. Thanks for your support and help of our open access life so far, but also that's, that's great, um, great work. So um, uh, thanks for sharing. And I, I think uh, we need to help you write that up so it's easy to share across the uh, um, uh, country so people can use it. So um, fab. Uh, okay, so next up is Jared. Um, I'll let you describe what you're doing and who you are. Over to you, Jared. Thanks, Paul. Uh, can I ask, is the 11.45 deadline a, a hard stop? No, it's yeah. an ambition of mine <laughs> with all my video calls is to try and do everything under the hour and get a bit of time back for us all. Um, gotcha. Okay, I'll, I'll do as much of a whistle stop tour as I can. Yeah, uh, cool. Let me just if it's good stuff, we should stay on. That's, that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, How's that working? Can people see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, so this now. is, uh, oh. Uh, so this is COVID-19 and new models of data stewardship. Uh, I put COVID-19 in the title because everyone else had COVID-19 in the title. Um, but this project was actually scoped and uh, started up before we went into lockdown. So um, a kind of balance we tried to strike with this research was make it uh, useful for the current pandemic context, but also uh, continue to have that kind of longer vision uh, and make it relevant for a post COVID-19 context as well. So you'll see that coming through in the research. It's, it's trying to, to meet, uh, satisfy those two masters. 
Um, so uh, I'll just talk about a bit of background to the project and the report that we just published. Um, I'll mention the three use cases and their relevance to COVID-19. Um, I'll talk about our general recommendations and then some key specific uh, COVID-19 takeaways. Uh, if you don't know us, um, I come from the Open Data Institute. We work with companies and governments to build an open, trustworthy data ecosystem where people can make better decisions using data and manage any harmful impacts. Uh, ODI HQ, ODI, ODI leads, very connected, so you're probably very familiar with us. But uh, the Health Foundation are an independent charity committed to bringing about better health and healthcare for the UK. Um, the context for this bit of research, like I said, it started off before uh, coronavirus and COVID-19. Uh, and the, the real challenge that which Adam Steventon, Director of Data Analytics at the Health Foundation, put really succinctly uh, is uh, healthcare systems are seeking to accelerate the adoption of digital and data-driven technologies while medicines and drugs are tested within randomized controlled trials, the approach for digital technologies is that they are tested in the wild and adapted over time in response to learning. Um, and what he goes on to say in his foreword for the report is that often these new uh, data-driven technologies are developed by private sector innovators. And, they, uh, and so you need to, in order to perform an, uh, an appropriate evaluation of that technology, you need to, um, access to data from that private sector organization and public sector organizations. And as we found in all the workshops we ran, um, contextual data, data from um, other aspects of society. And you need to be able to bring that all together in some meaningful way. So the goal of the project was to explore how new models of data stewardship can support the sharing of health data between the public and private sector to support the evaluation of new digital or data-driven health technologies. Um, I think a really useful comparison for evaluations is um, uh, in terms of pharmaceutical drug trials, which Adam mentioned in his uh, foreword, where those will go through four stages of um, assessment and evaluation. Uh, speaking kind of broadly, digital technologies will go through two kind of behind the scenes, and then the third and fourth are conducted uh, in the wild live. And so that makes it really difficult um, to kind of continue to assess the impact of those technologies because it's much harder to control or identify and isolate your variables and the impact of that technology is live. It's, it's, uh, it's much more widespread. Um, one thing to be aware of from the title of this project, so applying new models of data stewardship, what do we mean by data stewardship? Um, stewarding, the way that we talk about it at the ODI is stewarding data involves collecting, maintaining, and sharing data. And this includes making decisions about who has access to it, for what purpose, and to whose benefit. So what we were asked to do was to identify ecosystems where data wasn't being shared, wasn't flowing, um, and try to identify how to get data flowing in the right way. And part of that might be what we're calling data institutions. Um, the, the term is still being defined, but essentially, uh, can, could you create or install an institution within an ecosystem that would help to um, kind of balance competing interests or um, give you independent third party stewardship so that data can flow so that organization sources and users can feel comfortable sharing that data. Uh, so we did three use cases. We thought use cases would enable us to go really concrete and look at uh, concrete challenges and then uh, zoom back out from that and give kind of overarching lessons and takeaways. The first one was digital first primary care services, so things like Babylon, GP at hand, um, and your first interaction with the health and care system is digital. And then through that service, you are then directed uh, to other digital services or other non-digital services. We thought this one would be worth exploring because of the power dynamics between private sector innovators and evaluators. Um, and at, as I said, most of these use cases, kind of almost just through serendipity, ended up being particularly useful in a COVID-19 context. So in a pandemic, in a lockdown, when people uh, still have continuing health needs that they need from the NHS, um, how do you ensure that you are directing people through the health system in the most efficient, uh, effective, but also safe way? And part of that is through um, scaling up a lot of digital first primary care services. The second one we looked at was online information and misinformation and its impact on vaccine hesitancy. Um, so how might evaluators assess the impact of online misinformation 
uh, on not only vaccine hesitancy, but ultimately the health of individuals and the population as a whole. We thought this was worth investigating because online platforms, while they sit outside the health sector, uh, they nonetheless impact on public health. And so therefore might want to be evaluated uh, from someone like the Health Foundation. Uh, obviously, this also has a, a real pertinence to COVID-19. Um, I think we can already see a lot of misinformation being spread online, not only about coronavirus, uh, uh, 5G, but also potentially looking forward to if there is a vaccine developed, already a lot of information and misinformation swirling around that vaccine. Uh, the third one we looked at was patient flow automation tools. These are tools designed to really just nail your uh, real-time data flows within a, a hospital or a, a health sector. And then not only that, but be able to start modeling uh, the flows of, of patients through your hospital or resources, and then be able to take actions based on those predictions. So uh, maybe it, the model shows that there's generally an uptick in um, uh, the need for beds in a particular ward in this month. Therefore, you need to start creating space by taking patients and moving them to different wards or out of the hospital. It's about identifying those peaks and bottlenecks and taking steps to alleviate them. We thought this would be interesting because it doesn't directly interact with patients. Uh, so as far as the main recommendations, this one, which I've worded as, I guess, kind of tongue in cheek, uh, be more empirical, AKA do science. And what we realized when we started having our workshops was that there was, a, there was an expectation that, particularly within the Babylon use case, that a data institution could come in and it could balance those competing interests and, and could leverage private sector organizations into uh, providing access uh, to data or maybe the models that sit behind their services. But what we found was actually data institutions are less useful. Um, well, it's more useful to have a data institution when um, you don't already have a lot of leverage, when you're trying to balance competing interests or provide some sort of independent kind of arms lake stewardship. But in this case, we found that uh, the NHS has a lot of leverage here to dictate the type of data that they need in order to perform an appropriate evaluation. Uh, and that's because private sector organizations, companies want access to the NHS market. Therefore, we recommended putting specific recommendations, well, not even recommendations, requirements and clauses within um, contracts at the procurement stage to say, yes, we're gonna need access to this type of data for this purpose, for this evaluator. And linked into that, uh, we also recommended that innovators should get evaluators in the room early on to start arranging that data collection because what the evaluators told us in our workshops was that um, often a company and, and an NHS trust would say, we want, to, we want you to evaluate the impact of this technology and a year after it had been implemented and the type of data you need. And I think what's been coming out in this, um, in this session is that you don't just need health data and data from a, a, a commercial organization. You need contextual data, you need data from local authorities, you need data from you know, uh, uh, geography in order to help you identify and isolate your variables. And that needs to be collected from the beginning. So that's why we boil it all down to be more empirical, AKA do science. And the next step for this is to get uh, evaluators connected with the NHS to actually start putting that into contracts. Uh, the second big recommendation was evaluators and actually just a lot of organizations in the health sector who regularly collect, uh, store, use, and share data should start thinking of themselves as data institutions. And this gets to a point that we try to make that data institutions, the way we talk about them, don't necessarily need to be, you are creating out of thin air a new institution to sit within an ecosystem. It can also be about existing organizations taking on new roles and looking to take the data that they have, that they've acquired, um, and you know, uh, with appropriate permissions, then make that data available, findable, accessible for other organizations for other purposes. So we, uh, we recommended that they um, look to repurpose the data that they collect uh, through just naturally going through the process of an evaluation and look to repurpose it for another evaluation that they might themselves do or to share it more widely with academic researchers, other evaluators. Um, and so next step here is to work with organizations like the Health Foundation to explore what would that mean? What types of things would you need to do? How would you need to change permissions in how you collect data in the first place so that uh, the, the subjects of that data know that you are then going to use it in a, in a potentially different context? What does the, the IG look like for that sort of arrangement? And then finally, lessons for a post-COVID world. 
Um, and this is all in the report if, it, uh, if this whistle stop tour, whistle stop tour, loosely speaking, uh, uh, is too quick. But essentially we thought that in a post COVID world, a rush to adopt digital technologies runs the risk of creating a digital divide. There's been huge uh, promise shown by digital uh, first primary technologies, but uh, we shouldn't just then say, okay, let's rush ahead with installing these everywhere because we need to know where people are cut out of the system by these types of technologies. Uh, second, we shouldn't expect the same willingness to collaborate or share data going forward. And this is something that came out in all the workshops we ran, uh, regardless of who was talking to us. So it might apply to patients. Patients might not be as willing to uh, commit to data altruism for uh, a different topic. Um, I think the point is that COVID-19 and this pandemic are such a particular point in time that we can't expect it to continue. And it was particularly interesting, I think, for even health and care staff. Uh, a lot of health and care staff spoke to us about, we're happy to share data in this context, but we also really do worry about sharing data even within the health sector because we don't know, we know how it's been collected, what some of the limitations of it are, but we don't know that once it's shared, uh, whether that organization will understand and they might look, it might reflect poorly on us, it might even affect our funding. So those types of questions are important for even health and care staff. And then also we spoke to a particularly large um, social media platform that began at Harvard. And one of the people that, uh, that worked for them said, uh, you shouldn't expect social media platforms and online companies in general to have such an amount of agreement going forward. Uh, COVID-19 is a particular point in time where yes, pretty much everyone in the world has agreed that this is a challenge and we're willing to do things based on that. But uh, we can't expect the same sort of agreement for things beyond that, even potentially um, for vaccines, uh, anti-vaccination, MMR, uh, those types of, of challenges. Last one, top-down approaches should not become the default. We spoke to a lot of organizations who had developed small uh, 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 implementations of a new technology in their NHS trust, and then that had scaled regionally and then nationally, and they were advocating for um, continued uh, effort and um, uh, commitment to that type of innovation rather than what has shown to be uh, useful and also somewhat limited, I'll just stop there, uh, of more top-down um, driven uh, kind of government-led innovation. So those were our three lessons for a post-COVID world. Like I said, all of this is in the report uh, and it's linked within this, um, within this slide deck, which will be uh, posted on the website, I believe, at the end of this talk. Yeah, absolutely. Well, once you once you've joined Open Data Saves Lives, the rule is you stay. Um, so uh, uh, that's the uh, so it's a, um, we have a, had up to a fifty people at each of these sessions. It's over the summer. We've got a smaller number, but uh, all your output will be put on the one web page, and, and then you can share uh, what we're doing here as well. And obviously, it makes it really easy for you people to update and find uh, what you're doing there. Um, There's quite interesting chat going on whilst you were talking about um, power where that lies and, and also um, institutions and new things. So um, what, um, I've got one question, what happens next after the report? What, 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 what's, the, um, uh, what's the point? Uh, we're currently scoping that with the Health Foundation. What are next steps? Uh, I think possibly two things, don't hold me to this, but two things that, that seem reasonable. One is to uh, take one of those recommendations, which was work with evaluators and like I said, even actually more widely, just organizations who regularly collect, store, manage, share, and use data within the health sector to see how they can adopt more roles of stewarding and repurposing data uh, for, for, for public good. Um, and so working with an organization like the Health Foundation to identify how their, their data analytics team might be able to um, take what they already do and repurpose that. That seems like one uh, really useful way forward. And then um, since we only looked at three use cases, we wanted to do something potentially going forward that is within that use case. And the one that really jumps out to us is the um, online misinformation. Um, and so that would involve trying to partner with other endeavors and projects that are already underway looking at similar things. So last year, I believe um, the Royal Society of uh, Psychiatrists, um, I believe, you can double check me on that, put out a call for further work into getting access to Facebook data, social media data, to uh, understand the impact of social media on mental health. Um, 
And there are lots of other endeavors that are seeking to gain access to social media data. There's um, Social Science One at Harvard, which is gaining access to uh, Facebook data for the purposes of evaluating its impact on politics. And those are all kind of the same problem. It's all still a problem of incentivizing in some way large organizations who don't necessarily need to share data with you. You don't really have contractual leverage, um, but you do have the potential for helping them do something for public good. You have, even, even though we might look at it cynically, the potential for good PR. So how do you set up some sort of uh, organization or institution or mechanism to gain access to that data, regardless of whether it's mental health, vaccine hesitation, or um, um, impact on politics? So that, those are, I think, the next two steps. Great stuff. Well, thanks so much for sharing. And um, as I said, now you're, you're part of the, the group. Um, we'll, we'll definitely be having you back. And um, oh, yeah, HQ. To, sorry, before you, I just didn't want you to cut off. Could, uh, is there a way of saving the chat? Because I haven't had a chance to distill all of this. It's quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. So if people wanted me to respond, yeah. I could, but I would need to do it at a different time. Yeah, we'll so, be saving a copy so I can cool. share that with you afterwards. Cool. And then we'll put that in the. Um, there's an open Google Doc for each session, which we can put in there. And Perfect. There's a, there's a couple of questions you've got there. So uh, Mark had about questions about how are you going to fix point two, um, which I, I need to remind myself which was, which was point two. I think this is the last slide. Point about, I, a point about making the case for all of this, that data saves lives, that open data saves lives, and not come from a position of, I'm not saying you're doing this, but it's really difficult and people are going to be really worried about it. I think someone needs to grasp that and say, actually, most people are well up for linking data as long as it's done properly. And if Paul and I both had long COVID, I suspect we'd set up a WhatsApp group and talk about it and all that. And I think someone needs to make the case for data being a force for good. Uh, a lot of the narrative is too often all privacy concerns and then kind of nothing. People just say privacy concerns and then nothing afterwards. And I think that's fine because that's people can have that view. But I think another group of people, which might include us, need to come out and go, no, here's some really good examples of where data saves lives. So my, my example would be linking health data to police data on domestic abuse. And that was hard. It was really hard to get agreed. And it's got agreed and it's making massive changes. So I think there's a narrative around that, um, which Paul and I are kind of talking about and got some plans around yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, well, so organizations on this call definitely need to be part of that push. Uh, also organizations like Understanding Patient Data can help make that push. Um, one thing that was particularly interesting in the uh, Babylon GP, so the um, kind of digital first primary care use case was that, uh, I think you alluded to it, a lot of organizations hide behind the whoa privacy excuse. Um, but then when you really dig into it, actually, we found that that patients seem to be quite comfortable with it once the benefits were, were communicated. Um, and what was really happening was using whoa well, privacy as a way of not sharing data. So it was, a, it was a lack of willingness to share rather than really privacy concerns. And that aspect needs to be communicated and dealt with. Definitely agree. That's great, man. and I think there's a lot of people on this call who could join in with a, uh, you know, let's not start with uh, IG and privacy, let's start with, uh, let's fix the problem and do it right. Um, and, and also, um, not, uh, not, let, so not let the data hiders off the, off the hook by saying, whoa, GDPR, privacy, uh, care.data, and they just think about, it's almost like they have a whole list of words that, that create um, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I mean, saying, "Well, no, no, are you doing the right thing with your data?" Um, and we can maybe call them out on that. And um, I could probably guess that we're quite passionate about this, and there's a lot of people on the call who are. But actually, we need to actually calling people about what have you fixed recently, not uh, not watch a GDPR report or uh, uh, report you've written recently. What have you fixed? Um, so that's that's um, that's really good. So thanks, Jared. Uh, there's uh, questions in the chat. Uh, would anyone like to make a point before we uh, uh, finish off? So there's uh, Gemma's point about, about unintentional bias. Um, uh, yeah, we definitely need to do that. And we all need to do that together because um, doing it individually is really hard. Um, so yeah, getting that, getting that out there. Um, I'm going to finish off. Uh, we'll be in touch about the next session on the, on the 27th. Um, Anna Powell Smith's going to uh, join us for that. We're probably going to get uh, Chafford Data Lab talking about their really cool um, 
um, COVID tracker um, thing to reach local authority, which has already helped my mum and dad, who um, were really worried, then looked at it and said, well, there's a, there are no cases in Scarborough. So that, that took a lot of stress out of their system. Um, and, and then we've got probably one more talk that we're talking to a number of people about. So we're going to do the same thing again, three talks, then a conversation. And also, if you want to talk to your organizations about joining in with Open Data Saves Lives, we don't own it. It's something we've started. Uh, earlier, HQ are supporting us with um, uh, their data institution stimulus fund piece. Giles is on the line, is, is leading that work. We're also talking to a number of other people about how we um, amplify and uh, um, ex accelerate um, our work here. Um, and uh, so, yeah, please, please do join in uh, with what we're doing. And I'm five minutes over. Apologies, everybody. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're there. Okay. If there's nothing else, goodbye. And um, we'll see you on the 27th. Take it easy, everyone.